Welcome to the Muster Room Podcast. Uh, my name is Eric Potts, and as always, my partner in crime is uh, Austin Glickman. I see what you did there. <laughs> hey, I, they don't pay me to be here for nothing. They don't actually don't pay we, me. We anything, don't pay so. you. Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad we don't. <laughs> so why am I here? <laughs> <laughs> well, t- today our special guest is uh, Richie Corbett. He is the uh, Chief, were you chief of the volunteer fire department in Long Beach? Former chief. Former chief and OEM commissioner for Nassau County. Thank you. Welcome to the Much the Room podcast. My pleasure. Glad to be here. Now, I know that that you and Austin go back a ways because you guys were on the same fire department department together. Many years. Yep. How long how long did you guys work together? About 14 years. Yeah, long time. Yeah, long, long time. You were a fireman for 14 years? I was. Yeah. Up until recently, actually. Oh. Yeah. I didn't think you were that old. No, well, I, I got it when I was 18. Oh. All right. Then, yeah. I so thought, actually, I should have said I, I thought you were older. Um, <laughs> but I get that all the time, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but you did lose weight and you shaved your beard, which yeah. is good. Yeah. So we're, yeah, we're getting somewhere. All right. So um, t- tell us about how you got into firefighting. And, and Austin, obviously, you guys, this is really about firefighting and you guys to so jump in and talk about yeah, it. So together. first and foremost, Rich, just so you're aware, you're the first ever firefighter on the Muscle Room podcast. That's awesome. So, Thank you. Yeah. It should be uh, a, a nice honor for you, okay, <laughs> to be here with us. All right? lucky, lucky me. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, you know, the Muscle Room, it's not just law enforcement. We do focus a lot on law enforcement. But the muscle room is for firefighters, EMTs, paramedics, and military. and military. So we all have the same mission. Exactly. You're one of probably many firefighters that we're going to have on this show over the next few years because awesome. we know the show's going to go places. Um, so without any further ado, like Eric was saying, kind of give us a little background about who you are and how you got into the first responder field. Honestly, uh, when I was a little boy, I grew up in the Bronx and we used to hang out on the street back then when you were allowed to. And The craziest thing happened. We were standing around the corner uh, in the Bronx and we were all looking at the fire alarm box and we were talking about it and what happens and how the firemen get there. So I had the uh, the dare of want to pull the box and see what happens. So I pulled the box. The fire department came. But just as I was pulling the alarm down, my mother happened to look out the uh, (laughs) apartment window. (laughs) So. uh, Back then, uh, my mother came out after the fire department left, and she literally beat me to the firehouse. <laughs> uh, it was a different time, and it was well-deserved. Uh, but when I got to the firehouse, I was like, okay, I'm safe here now. And then my mother explained and told me to explain to the fireman what I did. And I just remember I was a little boy and this big, burly fireman. You could have killed somebody. You could have killed one of us. How dare you? This is like a life-saving operation. And I never forgot that guy. Wow. It just resonated with me uh, all these years. So when I when I moved to Long Beach, uh, I used to like watching the fire trucks. And back then we had the fire horns and I would try to figure out what was going on and listening around and, you know, chasing a fire truck or a police car on my bike. And when I turned 18, I joined the volunteer fire department. And cultivated a life of uh, first responder and fire. Uh, it, it has, uh, I never regretted a day. Yeah. Doing what I what, doing awesome. it. You know, I mean, I've had some good days. I've had some horrible days. I have some days that I still carry with me yeah. that I wish I didn't. Yeah. Uh, but the good days surely outweighed the bad days. And for you, Austin, how did how did you get into why did you get into firefighting? Well, almost the same thing as Rich, even though I, I'm not a criminal. I didn't pull the fucking fire alarm. <laughs> How dare you, first off? <laughs> I'm gonna scold you again like that. Your limitations <laughs> is gone, so I'm good. <laughs> um I think he got enough punishment from his mom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure he did. Yeah, especially the, the Irish mother mother that you got. I'm sure she gave you yeah. a nice whooping. Nice talking to. Yeah, talking to. Yeah. Um, I was uh, uh, in high school and a buddy of mine, uh, Zach Grunther. I, I bring up Zach a lot, actually, because he's one of my best friends and you know vice president of the organization that we work with. Um, he was a... Uh, a junior volunteer firefighter in the Point Lookout Fire Department, which is a neighboring town in Long Beach. And uh, I remember being like 16, 17 years old. And I would see Zach, you know, at the firehouse and he was wearing all this cool gear. And even when I was a little boy, I was obsessed with the fire department. I, same thing. I used to ch- make my dad and my mom chase the fire trucks anywhere in Long Beach or really anywhere on Long Island. If I saw a fire truck on license irons, I would beg them to follow. So I always had this uh, intuition to want to serve and become a firefighter. 
So seeing Zach, you know, doing it. And then we turned 18 and Zach became an official, you know, full fledged volunteer firefighter. And I'll always remember the day. I remember being in the car with him when Point Lookout got uh, an emergency call and driving in the car with him with that blue light flashing. <laughs> I thought we were the coolest fucking people in the world. I was like, this is fucking awesome. Like, it's almost like we're cops, but yeah, we're not. And right. people are pulling over for us and we're going, you know, quick through, you know, town, even, you know, we're supposed, you know, we're not supposed to, right? Supposed to do the speed limit. Supposed to do the speed limit. You know, the blue light here in New York is just a uh, courtesy light, as I learned later on. Um, But nonetheless, I felt like it was like this empowering, really awesome thing. And then seeing Zach run into the firehouse, you know, jump on the fire truck, they take off. Thankfully, it wasn't too long. It was probably a, you know, a bullshit call, but, you know, as we would say, and I think they came back and I was like, holy shit, I want to fucking do this. I want to do this too. So I, you know, turned 18 and I uh, signed up to to join the city of Long Beach volunteer fire department within a few months. I, I was, I was in the department and then a few months later I actually left to go to college. Yep. Um, and because of that, they actually created an, a, a new rule. The Austin Glickman <laughs> rule. The Austin Glickman rule where if you go away to, to college, your time away doesn't count towards your service. But I was the last one where it did count towards oh. my service. So I got off probation super quick compared to others who've, who've now been, you know, after me. Got it. Um, and they created this rule that, you know, that, that doesn't fly anymore. He had like eight months of active service. Yeah. And... 10 months away at school. So it all counted. So <laughs> yeah. he, got, he got off probation. Right. Got off probation. But no. he he did do all his required courses and kept his percentage up. I don't up. believe it. I, I, I was a buff. I still am a buff. And yeah. for those of you who are listening who don't know what buff means, it means somebody who takes it to the next level. I was so enriched in the in the fire department. I essentially lived there for those eight months that, that I was still here before I went to college. Really? I was in the firehouse 24 hours a day, seven days a week with all my friends. Because we, we, we all joined together. Fire nerd. <laughs> and we're going to get into this in, in a minute, but the city of Long Beach volunteer fire department is one of the busiest departments, uh, volunteer departments really in the country. Probably. Yeah. But, um, definitely on Long Island and in the New York area. I so, say definitely top 10 in the country. Oh, it's gotta be. Yeah. yeah. It's gotta be. We're so going to get into that. If you guys are, if you guys are that busy at, at, uh, at the Long Beach Island, or is it Long Beach Island? No, Just no, that's Long New Jersey. Beach. Yeah, that's I dare you say that, by yeah, the way. People right. get very offended. Let's see. Long Beach, uh, is, is, where does the funding come from? Is it through fundraising? Is it through government? Uh, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a city. Yeah. So they have a budget for the fire department. Okay. Okay. So. Hey, Rich, if you don't mind, just to kind of paint the picture for the for the listeners, what. How, how does the city of Long Beach uh, fire department work? Because it's not just volunteer. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a combination uh, fire department, paid and volunteer. Uh, we have uh, four tours of paid guys or women now we have a, a female firefighter who she's just a kick-ass firefighter crossfit member badass uh, yeah um, she's you know yeah you'd want her coming to help you so there's four uh tours uh four firefighters per tour with two paramedics okay they work uh one day on three days off and it's supplemented by volunteers very nice. I mean, that uh, that keeps you covered, and then the volunteers you, you know at what? night and stuff. We, as a uh, taxpayer in the city of Long Beach, you know, it, it, it's the best of both worlds. You know, you have somebody guaranteed to be there, right. especially now. Like Austin can verify the uh, volunteer fire service. It's hard to get people to come turn out. You know, with, with the economy and people going to school and some people having two jobs, and even kids nowadays are helping with the family bills. So. We have that guaranteed response, so we're really lucky with that. Yeah, and it seems like having the twenty four seven ALS is something that's uh, great to have. Absolutely, and, and what's good about that, uh, what's a little unique about that, is uh, the twenty four seven ALS is strictly for the Long Beach Fire for the city of Long Beach, and one of our neighbor district that we contract with. So, if you call for an ambulance at three in the morning, you're going to get somebody with advanced life support, and if that ambulance is tied up. The firefighters who are all ALS trained are going to show up with the engine and wait for another ambulance. So, right. you, you know, it, it, it's a great system. You're getting life-saving support to your to your location, Absolutely. which is awesome. Yeah. Um, now, Rich, do you remember after you became a, a full-fledged uh, volunteer fireman, do you remember your first call? Uh, I don't remember my first call. I remember my first fire. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was at the firehouse. I was cleaning the fire truck and... Uh, the call came in and it the dispatcher was like, you know, dropping hints and stuff like that. And so I got dressed and back then it didn't matter if you went to fire school or not. You know, you got on the job training. You yeah. know, like when you first started, I'm sure, you know, yeah. before you went to the academy, you were probably on the street for a couple of weeks. Yeah. And uh I remember we uh were driving, it was in East Atlantic Beach on Scott Drive, and we we're going around some twisty turny roads because Long Beach is a grid system, north, south, east, west, but Atlantic Beach, where we cover. Had some turns and stuff like that. And we pulled up and there was just smoke coming out of the garage. 
And so my captain was like, all right, follow me. So I followed him like a moron. I didn't know what I was doing. You know, <laughs> we're going to go down these stairs. Okay. You know, put your mask on. Okay. And so it was, you know, I was the deer in the headlights, you know, right. and uh, it was a small fire, but you know, that was my, my first and I'll never forget it. Did you, did you feel a sense of a trepidation? Did you feel a sense of uh, elation? I mean, what was the feeling knowing, knowing that you're going. And then when you got there and I know you were green and you, you were listening, but to see the fire and then to actually fight it. I mean, what's that feeling? You know, on the way there, I was a hairbag, you know, because I rode the truck probably 10 times, right? you know, so <laughs> what are we going into? What do we got guys? But when I pulled up and like the first arriving chief transmitted the work and fire, I didn't really pay it much mind. I got excited. Yeah. But then when I pulled up and I saw the heavy smoke out of the garage, it was just like, okay, what do I do now? Yeah. All the training, you know, everything, you forget everything your first time and you just run around like a madman. All right. I get it. Yeah. You too. Same thing. Well, my first fire was a little different. So my first real, real fire was a row of taxpayers uh, in Long Beach, which ended up being a four alarm fire. So it was um, one of the largest fires that we've had in the city of Long Beach. In a uh, long time. In a very long time. Yeah. So uh, I remember actually, I remember like it was yesterday. The call comes in. My pager goes off. I get out of bed. It's like two o'clock in the morning. And it was a very, very foggy night. Very foggy Very night. foggy. So I actually drove past an entire row of stores on fire. Didn't even see it. Really? That's how foggy it was. Now, at the time, the fire didn't really show itself. But there was at least one store that we knew of that was on fire. Yep. Fire was, was at the time, was already coming out the window. Didn't fucking see it because it was so foggy. Wow. Drive right by it. Missed my fire truck because I got out of bed late. Jumped up on another truck, end up getting there probably within a few a few minutes because it's actually close to the firehouse. And I remember <clears throat> walking down down the uh, the block, and uh, a fellow firefighter of ours, uh, Chino, um, he was also a, a sheriff in Nassau County, ends up breaking one of the store windows and this massive fireball. Now wow. this uh, store was like four stores down from where the original fire was. And at the time, we didn't realize that all these rows of stores were on fire just yet. Yep. We weren't aware yet. And Chino breaks the window just to get in. And I assume the rush of oxygen into the store fed the fire yep. and just woof, came right out the front window almost over me because I'm walking down the block. And I went, holy fuck. Like, th this is real. Th yeah. This is the real deal. It gets real. Like like anything, like your job and everything. You know, the first time you encounter something, it's like, okay, now it's real. Yeah. yeah. It's, this is the real I'm, thing. I'll be honest. It scared the shit out of me. Yep. And I, I get to my crew who was putting one of the first new um, attack lines into the uh, into the one of the stores. And I remember. All right. I'm going to I don't want to cause a rift between the volunteers and the pay guys. Right. But I'm going to say this anyway. One of the pay guys comes out of the first original stores and uh, he goes, hey, guys, fire's out. We got it. Because, again, originally we didn't know it was all these stores. At least they especially didn't know being that they were in one of the stores already. They thought it was just a content fire. So they were like, guys, fire's out. We're good. Just need to mop up. And we were like, uh, I don't think so, dude. Like <laughs> the fire is all the way down the block already. We then later found out a few minutes later that the fire made its way into the eaves. This was a very – not eaves, into the cock, cock loft. loft. This was a, a very old row of stores and it shared the same – um, attic space, attic attic space yes, yeah. originally so once the fire got into there it was a loss there was nothing that we could have done that right. was going to stop this fire and now, uh, yeah. earlier earlier you mentioned attack line for those of us who are uh, laymen what does that mean uh, essentially it, it's a hose line because it was a row of stores it's it's deuce and a half which means two and a half inch uh, hose uh, diameter um, very very hard to control even with five guys on the line, it's a very thick, heavy, and especially when you open up the, the nozzle, the pressure that's coming out of that that line, right. very hard to control, you know, even with a few firefighters on the line. So imagine only two or three. It's tough, and it's very heavy, and you're trying to drag it around a store. It's You know, you, you can't see anything. It's pitch black. Right. The only time you can see is when the fire shows itself and it lights up the entire room. Um, so we're, we're bringing in this, you know, first or second do attack line into this store, and uh, I remember... Uh, the captain who was on the line with me at the time, uh, John Marino, he because uh, he got there first and he ended up sucking through a lot of air. His bottle runs out. And he was like, Austin, he's like, stay on this line. Now I'm by myself at this point. And I'm like, what the fuck am I doing here? Because you're not giving up the line. That's, no, you, that's, can't, you can't you, give up the you line. You don't give up your line. Right. It's, it's, all, it's like um, it's degrading if you give up your attack line. So I'm standing, I'm holding this, this nozzle. And as the fire starts to roll over our head again, and I'm like, holy, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Like, at the, again, as Rich said, at the time, even in 2008, 
you still didn't need the fire academy to actually go in. Yeah. Now that course, it's all changed. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you didn't need it at the time. It was on the job training. And I'm standing there and I'm like, I don't really know what to do right now. I'm assuming I need to put the water on the fire. <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming that makes sense to me. Right. And I remember doing that for a second or two and the fire got knocked back a little bit. And then thank God, you know, more guys of, of my crew ended up showing up and, you know, taking over from there. And I kind of just followed their lead. But that right, was you were there that day? Fire. Uh, that was my first real fire as a chief. Okay. Uh, so we, explain your, what you were doing. Well, uh, when I first got, my first thought was like when I first became chief, I had a fire in a house. It was like a one room fire, got knocked down real quick. Then I had another fire, probably like one, one and a half rooms knocked down real quick. And my ego is, <laughs> it's a good thing I became chief because, you know, <laughs> we're saving all these, this property. Right. Then we pulled up to that fire and it was just, just deflated. There was just so much fire everywhere. Uh, a historical part of town. The restaurant where I took my wife on our first date is on uh, fire. You know, it's yeah. just, uh, and plus, you know, it's a small town. So we all know the people that work at these businesses. We know the owners of these businesses. And, but it was just something that I never wanted to see as chief. You know, right. as a fireman, yeah, I'm going to beat this fire's ass. But as a chief, you're just like, oh my God. Then as we're calling in more mutual aid and the alarms are growing, I realize I am responsible for every single person on the scene here. Yeah. And I've only been chief for a month, month and a half. You so know? what's that what's that feel like? I mean, is there is it organized chaos? Is it chaos? Are you controlling panic at all or I'm controlling my own panic. That's what I mean. Because, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I always say, you know, your image or the way you present yourself is 80% of the job. Yeah. So I always try to keep a cool head. But that's when I realized the importance on relying on the senior guys on the job. They didn't have to be chiefs. They didn't have to be from my fire department. But it was like, I would say, you know, my buddy Romano was a chief for many years back when they had these fires. Romano, any suggestions? Or Scott, what else should we pull in? That's you know? a sign of a great leader. So, right uh, I mean, it, it's not about me. It's about getting the fire out and everybody going home. Yeah. So it was uh, it, it was a real a big awakening. You know, it's uh, it's scary because... You also have some fire departments that don't have the formalized training that we do. You have some guys, you have the brand new guy that may have went to the academy once and all of a sudden he's deciding, oh, you know, I, ha I hate this, this term, but it, it rings so true. You know, we don't stand around and do nothing. Meanwhile, right. sometimes the safest place to be is across the street. Yeah. You know, when you're dumping that much water on it. So that's it. But it was a. Uh, they went out. Thank God for firewalls and alleyways. <laughs> yeah, hours, hours later, though. I yeah. mean, we were there for like 10 or 15 hours. Oh, long, long. And, and was, then we ended up going back the next day. It was actually and, uh, the weekend before Memorial Day weekend. So, yeah. like, these stores lost the entire summer business and stuff. So, it yeah. was. I'm going to ask a question that may be um, a little bit tough for you to answer. Um, but this is kind of what we're doing here with this. Is Do you remember, and I'm not talking about a, a fireman fatality, do you remember the first fire you went to in which there was somebody who died in the fire? And how did you feel? His name was Socrates. Okay. He died, uh, it was called the Victory Apartments. It was more of a, like a Section 8 housing. Uh, not bad people in the building, you mm -hmm. know, just going about their business. And it was the first time I saw a body that was burned. And, you know, there was guilt. Yeah. But- I, I kind of let it go and it, it was just, I, I'll never forget it. Obviously. Did, did anybody, did anybody, do you know that after that, any of your fellow firemen not deal with it the way you did and, and um, anybody have trouble with it? Back then there was no discussing it. Yeah. That's, you know, the, that, that's, that, that's, that's what uh, I learned uh, as I got older, you know, you were a pussy if you talked about it or, you know, if it bothered you. And so I, true. I, so I, I, true. I, I, it just, it kills me to this day that, you know, so many lives could have been saved if we just, we sat in the muster room and be like, listen, let's let it out. Exactly. Let yeah. it out. It's, it's okay to cry amongst ourselves. It's okay to yell. It's okay to curse, smash the plate, you know, yeah. it's okay. But uh, I found myself, you know, as the years went on, there, there were some traumatic events that, you know, I kept bottled up and, you know, it brought me to a bad place for a while in my life. And, you know, luckily I had the support of my wife, my family, and I was able to turn it around. And, you know, I, I don't hide any of my past personal life from anybody. I, I'll tell them, listen, I was at the lowest of the low. I ended up becoming a fire chief. I ended up adopting two kids. Now look at me. I'm, I'm the commissioner of Nassau County OEM. Yeah. So, you know, talk to people, get it out there. You know, let's, you know, we're there for each other. My, my line is if we can't help each other, who are we really going to help? 
It's so true. Yeah, How do you prepare true. a young firefighter to deal with something like that? I know when I volunteered, I spoke with some of the younger guys who sometimes after experiencing a call, there there's that um, like, oh shit, that just happened. I mean, I remember my first time dealing with something like that. And then afterwards, seeing younger guys coming on and because the, the interesting thing about volunteer firefighters is you're doing some other job. Like this isn't your full-time profession. You're an accountant or you're a construction worker or you're this, or you're that. And then your pager goes off and okay, now you got to switch hats and be a first responder. And I think sometimes, especially when you're starting, when you're 18, you're seeing things that people your age just don't see. Nope. And how do you, how do you as a, as a chief and now working with OEM, how do you prepare the younger generation coming up to deal with things like this when this isn't what I mean, it's not what I expected when I first came on. It's something it comes with the job, but how do you prepare the younger generation for that? I would, I would always, uh, after the probies, you know, the probies. That's what the new, new guys are called. New girls are called. After they would go through their initial training, I would try to meet with every one of them individually. You know, just give them a little bit about myself, and you know, tell them a couple of war stories. You know, what you can expect. You know, just because you're volunteering doesn't mean you're not going to see. The shit that you see on TV that you don't that you see in the movies that you know that the FDNY sees you, right. you're gonna see it. Yeah. So I, I would just tell them like, listen, if you see something you know that bothers you, come to me. Or I would actually go to after some fires, I would go to the firehouses and talk to the guys. I, I'd show up, you know, with a case of beer. I'd show up with some burgers. I would show up with a pizza pie and be like, listen, anybody want to talk about this? You know, and you, you know, when you're in a group, when you're in a group with a bunch of guys. No one ever wants to talk about it. Right. But, you know, on a rare occasion, the phone would ring. Yeah. And I'd be like, listen, it's okay, but do me a favor. Let, let's talk about this. Uh, and I uh, tell you guys to reach out to me. I, I don't care. You know, right. let, let's, you, you can't swallow this up. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a horrible feeling. And thankfully now, you know, moving forward to 2022, I know the Long Beach Fire Department's been doing this for a while now. After every major incident, you do have a debrief. That's yeah, they, they, have, they have a critique. So important. Yeah. yeah. But also the... Uh, I'm on the Nassau County Fire Commission. I represent the 2nd Battalion. Uh, I do a lot of stuff. Uh, but the critical incident stress debriefing, so yeah, yeah, that's what the critical stress team, they show up every once a month to meet with the Fire Commission just to let remind us that they're there. Yeah. You know, how to contact them. Make sure you guys got our number, right? And there are a bunch of volunteers that are trained. Uh, they're not psychiatrists. They're not psychologists. There are a bunch of volunteer firemen that have been there and done that, and they, they want to help. And I've right. actually called them out for a couple of calls. Yeah, and I, I haven't done it in years, but I was part of a critical incident stress management team. So, no, I get it. Um, yeah, it's it's so important. You, you said it. It's so important just to talk it out. Don't bottle it up because you said you held a lot of this stuff in and, and you got into a bad place. And it's so important that we don't allow these young guys to get into those bad places. Because like you said, if you didn't, if you complained about it when you were our age, when you were just on the job, you were a pussy. You yep, were, absolutely. So it's, it's good to, that uh, we have these things in place. Now, on the, on the other side of that, have you been involved in fires in which firemen have died in the line of duty? I am so blessed that I've never been the incident commander where a firefighter has died. Thank God. I, you know, I, every time that we had, uh, a fire or something like that. My biggest concern, I would go around to every rig afterwards, the mutual aid companies, you guys are good. All right. Thank you. I'd go to every officer, all the guys and be like, everybody's good. Anybody's hurt. You know, let's take care of it now. And yeah. I was, I was really, really lucky and beyond blessed to not ha ever have to do that. I mean, one time Austin got hurt in a fire I did. And, I, and I had to go to his house Yeah, that was, and I lived down the block from him. No, no, it was it was definitely way more than a stub toe. It right. was it was, it was crazy. a legit knee injury, right? Tore my ACL. Yeah, and uh, I, I had to go down to his parents, and we lived on the same block. Yeah, and you know, like his dad was my electrician, and you know, it was just it was hard to go. To, there was nothing life threatening about his injury, but it was just you know, it was hard that I had to go yeah. tell a neighbor that his kid who gives up his time and you know his health to help his community got hurt. Yeah. So, I mean, that's just one of the stories that sticks in my head. You know, Austin and I didn't always see eye to eye on certain things. I don't see eye to eye with a lot of people. I, so, <laughs> but you know what? Imagine that. Yeah. We, 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 but I'm here today, you know, because, yeah. you know, we're, we're able to be professionals about things. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, that was a that was a crazy incident. Um, I was working at the time actually under your command. Yes. Also, not just for, as a fire chief, but Richie didn't get into it too much. But he was the um, the supervisor for the city of Long Beach Police Department special police officer. Uh, not a program, but it's uh, well. They have a program, but it was a full time position for me and a couple of other people. Right. So at the time, I was I wanted to get into law enforcement. So the city of Long Beach has this program for those of us who are in college who want to get into law enforcement, um, where we're essentially like beach patrol. We do crowd control. We write parking tickets, things like that. And because the city charter allows city employees to respond to emergencies as a volunteer firefighter with permission of your uh, supervisor, being Rich was the fire chief. Of course, I had permission. <laughs> I was working one night and uh, Pedro goes off for a reported building fire. Now, that's one of the reasons that we're allowed to go to uh, to the scene and leave our current job. So I get on scene. I remember I responded from the boardwalk. You know, I actually uh, stripped down naked because I didn't want to ruin my uniform. Yeah. So I literally got completely naked, put on my fire department, uh, you know, garb and go into the building. It was, uh, I think it was ended up being like a two or three alarm uh, basement fire, but it was a garage. That was the car fire. It was, it was a garage, it was yeah. Multiple cars on fire in a garage, but uh, there was no ventilation, so there was nowhere for the smoke to go. And it was just, it was a nightmare trying to get the hoses inside, and the hoses got stuck underneath car wheels and yada, yada, yada. So me just being stupid and thinking I'm this, you know, jacked, you know, young kid, I thought, I could, well, I could carry an entire hose down this, you know, ramp by myself. And I learned the hard way I couldn't. So I'm dragging this hose, this charge hose line down, down this ramp. And I ended up tripping on another hose line, which I couldn't see at my feet because again, I was breaking the cardinal rule. I was walking into a fire. I wasn't crawling. Right. So, so it's completely my fault. Trip over the hose line. Uh, my body goes one way. The hose goes the other way that I'm carrying and twist my body. Ooh. I feel the crack, 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 crack in my knee drop to the ground. I was stupid. Also didn't grab a radio because I was so happy to go inside. Yep. So I'm laying there by myself Ugh. completely you know smoke and i couldn't move i just knew i didn't feel the pain yet though yeah. but i knew something was wrong really wrong and i remember taking off my my regulator uh to scream for help and then i sucked in all this you know toxic smoke e immediately now thank god I, I was able to get my regulator back on right away because if not i probably would have died actually taking in you know toxic smoke like that yeah. and i put my regulator back back on and i just thought to myself all right well thank god i fell where i'm on the hose line firefighters coming in or coming out are going to find me at yeah. some point. I got plenty of oxygen in my tank. So I kind of came to peace that I, I know I was going to get found. And I did within probably 30 seconds or so, a firefighter stumbled over me. Probably he was, he was actually walking also. Yeah. <laughs> and it trips over me, finds me. They think I'm dead because uh, they, yeah, they, they gave a mayday for that yeah, too. Gave, right? That, was, that was my first mayday. And I was just like, what? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they drag me out by the straps of my, my pack and they bring me outside and they rip all the shit off. And I'm trying to tell them I'm okay. But I think everyone was just in crisis mode. Yep. And I remember Hadrick Ray, who was my captain at the time. He, and now he's the, one of the chiefs of the fire department. Um, they threw an oxygen mask on me for whatever reason. And he takes the oxygen mask off and goes, Austin, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I'm fine. And from a, from up top, he lets go of the oxygen mask. And <laughs> whoosh, it smacks me back in the face. I'm like, oh, what the fuck? They put me in the ambulance. And again, now at this point, now the pain's starting to come in because, you know, I'm, I'm relaxing and I can feel the pain coming onto my leg. So I'm, t I'm telling Eileen to Barry, who was the, the medic at the yep. time, I'm going, Eileen, something's wrong with my leg. And she goes, okay. She goes, we got to cut your pants off. And I go, no, I'm, my, my, my dick's out. <laughs> I'm, I'm naked. I'm like, you can't take these pants off. And she's like, well, y we have to. So I remember them giving me a towel. And I, and I covered myself and then they <laughs> they take my pants off and you know they, they do sure it they wasn't a washcloth no, <laughs> yeah, you yeah, said yeah, not me yeah, yeah. it wasn't a washcloth <laughs> and they end up you know doing the full assessment and then yeah you know ended up learning a day or two later it's a torn ACL and I had to go through that whole you know surgery and all that stuff but that was a pretty crazy experience yeah it, it was uh, it was a hot night uh, we were actually had a department meeting that night mm. and uh, stuff like that happened so yeah. guys listen I, I keep looking down at my phones I just gotta make sure nothing no. is going on so well, I don't want you to think that kind of role. I guess that kind of rolls into our next po yeah. portion. You're so you're acting. Oh, and we're going to get back to the fire department. So I want right. to talk about Hurricane Sandy, but you are the OEM commissioner for Nassau County acting, acting OEM commissioner, but you were the deputy commissioner yes. for, for, for OEM uh, now acting, hopefully soon to be full time. If uh, for those of you who are <laughs> Nassau County politics, <laughs> um, tell us about like OEM. What, the, what is OEM? How'd you get involved with OEM? Uh, OEM is the office of emergency management. Uh, I uh, am responsible for, to make sure that the uh, all first responders have whatever they need to help the residents. I, wa I work closely with DPW because all grants that are come into Nassau County funnel through OEM, whether it be uh, emergency road repairs, infrastructure repairs, vests, 
tasers and stuff like that. Uh, we're big with the uh, fire department TRT teams. So we, what is uh, that? Uh, technical rescue teams. Okay. Uh, not every fire department in Nassau County, 72 fire departments, not everybody has their own technical rescue team because of the uh, training and the cost. So there's like five or six teams that have merged from different departments and we help get them equipment because if the three of us are from three separate departments, your department should be responsible for uh, paying for it all. So it all comes from Nassau County. Okay. So uh, that's that. Uh, we uh, we draw up plans. We're constantly updating plans for emergencies, uh, no matter what the emergency is. Uh, planned events. Joan Jett is playing uh, Jones Beach, uh, Eisenhower this weekend. So awesome. we have some, we have uh, mass gathering plans, you know, plans with EMS, with fire, with uh, police to work together. We have a, uh, a command post with all the radio frequencies that everybody works out of. Uh, and we got some pretty cool toys, you know. I mean, it's uh, it's it's a, it's a great job. I absolutely love doing it. Uh, and what what I love the most about it is it's. I always joke around that being a first responder now, I'm 54 years old. You know, we fall down, we pull a muscle, we don't heal like we used to. Yeah, it takes a lot longer. So. I don't want to say I'm not technically boots on the ground. It's like I'm a first responder from behind a desk. I help coordinate. Right. Yeah. You know, like when I'm not the incident commander, I work with the incident commander. I get him what he wants. And what happens is if somebody needs something, they go through uh, their resources. If like a fire department doesn't have it, then they will call either a neighboring department. And if they don't have it, then they'll call OEM. We will scour the county to see if we can get them any resources. If nobody in Nassau County has it, then we'll go to the state. If the state doesn't have it, then they'll go to the feds. So it's it's a progression. It's it's easy way to track. We learned during uh, Hurricane Sandy, uh, I happened to make friends with the governor, his secretary, because she was here. So she's like, anything you need, you call us. So I would call her. I I need, you know, yeah. I need widgets. <laughs> but then they would find out, all right, listen, Long Beach needs widgets. So Nassau County would OEM would, would order them for us. So I would be taking two people to get me widgets because I wanted them because I didn't follow the chain of command. Gotcha. So like there's a progression. And, and so OEM has been around for a long time. It's uh, I don't want to say it's a relatively new discipline here in New York, but the South, especially the places that are hit with the most natural disasters have been following it for decades. Yeah. And uh, California fire, uh, California, Florida, uh, Texas, and Louisiana. I mean, they are so established in their emergency management systems that, they basically wrote the book for it. And so it's a federal thing now with FEMA. So we're all working together to get on the same page to make sure we operate uniformly. And it's unfortunate in this day and age, but does OEM get involved in mass shootings and school shootings and what the plans may be? We are literally, I had a meeting with my plans chief this morning and uh, one of my plans guys, and we are doing a mass casualty plan. We are updating it. Wow. We had a class with the National Transportation Safety Board for a plane crash because you need family reunification centers, you need Red Cross, you need you need therapists, you need traffic control. Yeah. And so we're adopting that into the mass casualty plan. That's okay. great. Now, most people probably don't know this, but I myself used to be an emergency manager before. Yep. Uh, I mean, of course, you know, um, of those listening before I got into law enforcement, uh, I got my master's degree in emergency and disaster management. And I worked for the Mount Sinai Health System as an emergency manager for um, about 11 months before I got called by the NYPD. Uh, little did I know how much work goes into these plans and the training. So a big credit to you, because not only are you now the head of OEM, but you're the head of OEM for one of the largest municipalities in the country. And the safest. And the safest, yeah. Well, you know what, also, I, I appreciate those accolades, but without my staff, I'm nothing. No, I, I get that. You know, but I, I want you, I, I do appreciate you acknowledging the fact that I'm the commissioner, but without the people that are behind me, you know, I'm nothing. And and, and that, that's, that's so the So let's give them a big shout out. So huge shout out to the entire staff, staff at OEM. OEM. Yeah, thank huge, you guys huge shout for out. You guys are the best and Woo-woo. I appreciate everything you do. Yeah, but- you're not an empty suit, right? You're, you're not just someone who was placed there because you're a figurehead because you're politically connected. You were placed there because of your knowledge and experience. I like to think so. Yeah, I think so. I know so. Because, I appreciate again, that. we've been on plenty of emergency calls together. Yep. Um, Get a room. Yeah. Well, I, thought, I thought you were not <laughs> doing that at the end of this. We spoke about it on one of the other shows. I'm jealous. Um, I think that's actually a great lead in because of all the training and experience that you have. But there was one incident in particular. A very large incident. Um, 2012. That, 2012. That 
probably, I know it definitely shaped your career. It definitely shaped mine. Uh, so let's get into that because that's one of the main focuses of this podcast today is I want to talk about Hurricane or really Superstorm Sandy. I forgot about that. You did forget about that. Yeah, yeah. Very, very small incident. Um, if you can, can you kind of paint the picture of the storm itself? Not of the incident, but kind of for those of for those who weren't on the East Coast, um, what was Superstorm Sandy and why was it such a large storm? It was uh, three storm, three hurricanes basically coming together. And they all happened to meet basically in New York Harbor during a moon tide. Yeah. During, you know, the Earth's axis was going to the left. Uh, somebody annoyed the savior. <laughs> and I mean, it, 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 it was basically everything that could have gone wrong with weather went wrong with weather. Yeah. And the reason... So I'm, I was a weather geek when I was in emergency management. So this is the only reason why I know this. So the reason it wasn't a hurricane technically when it made landfall because it was 74 mile per hour Correct. sustained winds. So it's not considered a hurricane, which is 75 mile, right. mile per hour sustained winds. But as as Chief Corbett just said, it was these three or so odd storms that merged together off the coast of uh, Florida. Really, it, it started down there, but yeah. the, it, I think it actually they all merged together. Well, like in, in the Caribbean, Caribbean, New Jersey, and New York, yeah, coastlines. Yeah. It devastated. Yeah. I mean, probably the, I think it was actually the most devastating storm, even though it wasn't considered a hurricane, one of the most devastating storms money wise yes. uh, in the history of the United billions States. Billions and billions. And we're talking yep. about, I mean, category five storms have hit down in Florida, Louisiana, Katrina. Katrina, right? But I think even Superstorm Sandy, because of where it hit in yes. particular, was more damaging than any other storm or one of the largest storms in in the history of the country. That's because of the uh, population density. Right. Yeah. That's that's why. Right. So I think it ended up actually making landfall right on the border of New York and New Jersey, right in the, in New Jersey. Yeah. And the devastation. And Joe, maybe you could throw up some some photos and videos of the storm itself uh, for the. For I'm the sure you. Viewers. Sure. In in uh, Long Beach, there are still houses that are. Damaged or destroyed oh, yeah. in New Jersey. Oh, yeah. There's still houses yeah. damaged, destroyed, and haven't been fixed. So October 29th, 2012, Superstorm Sandy made landfall in Jersey, right on the on the border. And for those of you who don't know, Long Beach is uh, essentially across the road from from New Jersey. If, yeah. if you look at it on, on you a can, map, uh, what, Sandy Hook, you can see our yeah uh, our shoreline. You could we can see them from us. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, so I'm it, guessing it's they can very see. very close. Yeah, I mean it, it's if you put a straight line, it's probably quicker than driving from here yeah, to for sure. you know wherever. So take us through. That day, both of you guys, and okay. and, and and what's happening? You're you now you know the storms are coming. They haven't hit yet. What's going on? Then bring us into when it hits and and how you you're dealing with it all. all right, uh, for a couple of days, we're watching it. You know, we're like, okay, th this might be something. Right. This 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 appears it might be something because don't forget we had uh, Irene the year before. Oh uh, yeah, so that's Irene was supposed to. You know, that was that was the death blow. Right. Yeah. But it gave us nothing. Mm -hmm. It gave us nothing. A couple of down trees, you know, no, minor, minor, minor flooding. So Superstorm standing is coming. But this is, uh, it's looking at the graphics and everything and listen to the weatherman, you know, this is it. This is it. But it, this was it a year ago. And people evacuated for uh, right. the year before. So we're getting closer. So I'm starting to tell the guys and the girls, do me a favor, go shop for your firehouses, get three days worth of food. Get everything prepared. Send your families away. Um, some people are like, what do you mean send my family away? That you, we can't have your families in the firehouse. Yeah. Well, I'm not staying. I understand, but I can't have your families up there. You can't have your dogs up there. We can't have kids up there. So uh, so people, you know, the young guys are kind of excited. I know? was. I, I yeah, was. Yeah. It's yeah. weird to say of this for, for those who aren't first responders, but I was actually looking forward. Nobody now, understands that. Nobody in understands hindsight. I, of course, I wouldn't want. To. I worked it. I didn't look forward yeah, to it. it. I was, was standing out it there. It was terrible. Yeah. But at the time, I was a young gun. I only had a few years in the department, yeah. and this was going to be a, my first real major disaster that I was going to take part of. Yep. So uh, we uh, we start going around like each uh, at the time. I bought a boat for each firehouse, like like an inflatable raft. You yeah. know, so the guys can drag. And uh, it's getting closer, and every day is getting a little closer. So then we order the evacuation probably a day before. Which is typical. Yeah. No one's leaving. Yeah. No one's leaving. A couple people left. Uh, Everyone it, thought it was going to be a dud, just like Hurricane Irene. That's exactly it. So I remember the night before, uh, I'm talking to Richie Shue, this guy, another guy in the fire department. He's like, I think this is going to be bad. <laughs> I was like, I, th I think it might be because, you know, you look at 
I, I rely a lot on my weather information from surfers. Mm. You think they're a bunch of stoners. You think they're a bunch of morons that are riding away. There's nobody that knows more than the weather than a surfer. Yeah. They want they, those waves. They, that's yeah. it. Yeah. So, and, and I'm not implying that he's a stoner or anything, but like <laughs> in, in general, when you stereotype somebody. Right. But Shu's a huge surf guy. He right? is. Yeah. And uh, so I'm like, yeah, I think it might be. So the day of comes in. It's a beautiful day. Yeah. There's yeah. nothing wrong. You know, the waves are coming in, you know, crashing along the boardwalk and all the media's down there. And Al Roker. Yeah. Uh, every schmuck from <laughs> north of Sunrise Highway. Oh, we're coming down to see God's Theater. Oh, you know, I, I, yeah. so, and, and all I'm thinking is, as a first responder, is like, if we have to get out of here, yeah. jerks like you are going to be stopping at Starbucks, dropping, you know, blocking traffic. Right. So, uh it's building up. It's building up. Lifeguard headquarters gets swept off the uh, <laughs> off the pilings. Uh, Channel Twelve is down by uh, where the lifeguard headquarters is, and she's doing her report in the street now. She gets swept off her feet on wow. the street. So now I'm starting to get a little pissed off. Now I'm like, why are these people down here? Why aren't they backing up? Because they're just putting my people in danger. Yeah, and and that's the the mindset I'm starting to think. I'm like, okay, now it's like. Put the image away, you know, put your, you know, your press clothes away. Now it's time to start, you know, boots on the ground. And as time goes on, it rains a little bit. Then I'm starting to hear other fire departments like Island Park is one town north of us. I mean, we, right over the bridge. They are screaming on the radio because the flooding. They flooded probably 10 hours before us. Wow. And they are much lower than us. They're like a bowl. There, it was built on marshland. Yeah, um, and it was uh, they're they're screaming for help, and we're like, "What is going on there?" And we we get to the top, we can't even get into Island Park because of the flooding, <laughs> and so there's boats floating on the main street, and it, it it's nuts. So now the flooding starts coming to us slowly. It comes in real slow, like eerie. You know, it's like when you watch a horror movie. You know, when the bathtub fills up, yeah. it starts like going. Yeah. Oh, you know, something bad's gonna happen. Right. So. Uh, I'm at fire headquarters at this point. I'm in front of fire headquarters. Uh, I visited all the firehouses, make sure everybody's set and what have you. The water starts coming up and it's coming up. And now it's about three inches deep. The bay has met the ocean already. And all of a sudden, I just look north and we have a big uh, power plant in Island Park. It just goes. Boom. And all I see is it was just a big gray blue light. Not that loud. loud but... It, then it was the eerie silence and the lights went out. Everything went out at the same time. Wow. Yeah. And we're like, okay, this isn't good. Yeah. This is not good. And uh, we still had cell service at that point. You know, we still have radio communications at that point. But I was lucky that I have two chiefs that were below me, uh, Chino yep. and uh, RJ Tusillo. They were two young guys who had no kids. They weren't married. So they told me, Richie, go home, be with your wife and kids. We got this. So I'm like, are you sure? I said, I'm a phone call away. So they sent me home because there was a lot of rumors from people that, you know, some haters out there were going around saying how I abandoned the city and all this other stuff. So I just want to set the record straight on that, if, if, sure. if I may. Absolutely. Yeah, those guys. You know? And uh, they, so- I want to know a lot of them. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, but uh, two particularly. But uh, they stepped up and they told me to be with my, my wife and kids to protect them. Right. They didn't have kids, so they were cool with that. Cell phone service was still good. And- uh, so well, can I say, say something real quick? So no. the, I remember the, the last thing you said to us before you actually left. Um, so it was a general rule at the time that when winds got above a certain mile per hour, I think it was 60 mile per hour. Yeah. Uh, and this is a national, this is like a national standard. Yeah. You cannot do any more emergency response. You're not allowed to because you're now putting yourself in grave danger. You can't lose your volunteer. You know, excuse me. You can't lose your, your first responders because right. now who's going to show up afterwards if there is a true emergency. So I remember before Rich left. Again, one guy, okay, you went to all the firehouses. That, was that included unless it was life or death? No, right? no, no. This was, you are no longer allowed to respond. Again, this, it's, this is a national standard. Wow. You cannot respond once it, it hits a certain criteria. Okay. And we hit that criteria. Yep. Um, and it was, I don't know, maybe say like six o'clock in the, in, the, in, in the evening. It was still young, you know, early on. Still early, yeah. And uh, he left. And I remember all of us in the firehouse, we were like, what the fuck? We can't, re like, we're, we, we're the fire department. What do you mean we can't respond? And it, it, um, it was weird for us to to like hear that. Yep. Later on, we had to break that rule, and we'll get into that. But yeah, that I just I remember being a young guy and hearing like I can't. I'm, I'm a but fireman. Now, is, you've been in the police academy. You've heard the same thing. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, no, I, 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 I just it's a national to, standard. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's just, no, it's, you know, That's like that's the rule across the board. Yeah. So and I just remember you saying that, and it was just it was. I, really I had weird. to make some decisions that I, I'm not, 
you know, I didn't want to make. Yeah. But you know what? How would I tell your mother and father, you know, oh, he was out, you know, there, there was a car stuck in water. It turned out nobody was in it. But, you know, the car got swept on top of him and he drowned underneath the car. Right. You know, I, I had to weigh, you know, risk versus reward on everything. Yeah. You yeah. know, everybody was told to evacuate. You know, yeah. so. And unfortunately, they did. not Yeah. So uh, later on that evening, so uh, my phone rings. Cell service is dead, but somehow somebody gets through. Richie, there's a big fire in the canals. So I was like, okay. Call, I'll get the fire department there. And uh, there was eight houses burning in, in the canal section. Uh, wow. Very uh, small. It's, it's a decent sized section, but the houses are all close together. I mean, everybody heard about the fire in Breezy Point where all the houses went up. Yeah. It was basically a smaller scale than that. So uh, the firefighters that were in headquarters, they saw this from the roof of City Hall. I was on top of yeah. the roof watching they, it. They, they all decided, you know, mm-hmm. listen. They didn't say fuck Richie Corbett, but they said people need our help. This place is burning. Well, we so the way that we actually received the call was two ways. So again, our nine one one communications went down uh, uh-huh. around like seven o'clock. So yeah. now at this point, the water was probably knee deep, and it would continue continuing yep. to rise. Eventually, it got to about waist deep. Some points it was it was chest high, um, about five to six feet of water um, in, in other areas of, of Long Beach, and we were up on the roof because somebody came running to the firehouse. I guess from the canals, or I don't know how they got the message to us, but they did. Yep. And they came knocking on the door. Hey, listen, there's a massive fire in the canals. And then it somehow we did receive a phone call too. And like Rich was saying, even though we had no cell service, every once in a while you would be able to send a text message or a phone call would come through. And we 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 all go to the roof. It was a, a lot of volunteers and a bunch of the paid guys, and we're all listening, you know, watching. And I think it was Moose, who is an all time uh, paid guy, was like, "No, nah, we." we we, we got to go. Yeah, it was him and Tommy O'Dowd. Yeah, yeah. And Tommy O'Dowd was the lieutenant at the time. So we essentially were falling under his command under, under the chiefs. And he was like, we got to go. We ha- we're yep. going to try. We don't know if the trucks are going to make it there, but we're going to go. Yep. And I remember that that journey. The journey yep. alone was yep. a crazy journey. And the firehouse that was closer, the guys couldn't get their rig out, but they had a portable pump that they put the, uh, they put the portable pump inside the raft that they had. And dragged it down there. And th- these guys are, you know, waist deep, yeah. v- walking through sewage water mm. and just trying to, you know, it was basically, okay, every house in the middle is on fire. Let's start protecting this house and this house and work our way in. Right. And from the back. And uh, it, w- it was an operation that went on. But the craziest thing is, like Dawson said, they were walking there and getting there. It was <laughs> knee deep to waist deep. By the time the fire was out, the water was gone. Really? Well, we were also there for like eight hours. But- and the, if you think about it, Island Park was flooded for days. Yeah. Katrina flooded for weeks. Yeah. Our water came up and it went away. Yeah. So well, through, the, through the whole the whole town, not just in that bowl no, the, whole town, the, the whole town. The whole town. The whole barrier island. As wow. quick as it came on, it's as quick as it left. Wow. So it, it, it was, we were lucky in that sense uh, because people were able, like that day, people were ripping their house, like all the sheetrock out and throwing stuff out. Yeah. So, it, I mean, it was nuts. Yeah. So, it was nuts. So I remember, I'm just going to tell my side of the, I guess the story real quick, because did you make it on scene that night? No. Okay. So we jump in the fire truck and we take off and there's literally this cars floating by us. Cause the, the, you know, the large, you know, 30,000 pound, I don't know how much a fire truck weighs, but it's really fucking heavy. So as we're driving by, we're creating these wakes and the cars are getting lifted up and they're floating by us and we're hitting every, everything that, that could be in the middle of the road. We're hitting. There was parts of the boardwalk that got ripped away and we're, we're literally just crushing these things as we drive by and how these engines made it there. I have no clue. I think it's probably just a luck or, or, you know, somebody was looking down and wanted us to get there. And I remember showing up on scene, these row of houses completely engulfed in flames and it was so windy about you know 70 75 mile per hour winds there was chunks of the houses that were flying off not embers yep. wooden chunks on fire flying past your face it was like a movie and we get on scene we hook up to a hydrant and all the neighbors that were outside watching essentially their houses burn start cheering for us like yeah that you guys made it thank you so much you guys are our heroes and we're like we got this we're gonna put out this fire <laughs> And we open up the hose line and the water goes boom, 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 and just nothing. But don't forget also, remember the guys that were that were operating the engine, they had to try to hook up to a hydrant that was underneath the water. Right. No, I, I'm the one who hooked up to the yeah. hydrant originally. So it, it was the, the task alone was astronomical. Right. And nothing comes out of the hose line. And the entire crowd goes, yeah. Oh, <laughs> shit. Like they got so <laughs> deflated, you know. And uh, we essentially had to fight this fire with our bare hands. 
Yep. We, we were able to get some type of water pressure. We had the portable pumps that were actually dredging water out of the street. Yep. And um, I remember at one point, Dave Latterell, who was uh, no longer a firefighter in Long Beach, but he was he was one of the captains at the time. He grabs me and he goes, I need you to get to the roof of this house. And I go, what? It's 75 plus mile per hour winds out there. You want me to go to the roof of this house? He goes, we have no other choice. You need to get to the roof of this house. Now, mind you, every house around me is burning. The car below us exploded. The tires were exploding. There was a gas tank, or not a gas tank, a um, propane tank on on the uh, house next to us oh. that had you know barbecue. Yep. And we were worried about that. And we were taking bricks that we found. There was a house under construction. We took these bricks. We're breaking windows, just using bricks and just throwing them through the windows because we didn't have any tools because the right. trucks were so far away and we couldn't get to them. We find a portable ladder that's up against one of the houses that, again, was under construction. I go on top of the roof. And I'm looking around. I'm like, what the fuck am I doing up here? With the wind blowing. With the wind. I'm like, I'm going to die. I really, at that point, in, 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 in at my point at the time was I'm not making it back from this. Um, I literally thought I was going to die. That was the first time in my career as a, as a first responder that I actually thought that that was the end of me. And it was me and Maziotti. Mm-hmm. And we're, we're up on top of this ladder and he hands me this hose line. And I just put this hose at the time. At, at that point, the fire had made this massive hole in this house. Now, as Rich was saying, we were trying to protect the surrounding homes. So we went to the last house that was on fire. And we knew if we put this fire out, all the other houses should remain intact. So I just remember putting this hose line into this hole, opening up the nozzle and just just standing up there for a good you know 20 or 30 minutes as just complete chaos was happening around us. It was like out of a movie. You were like Lieutenant Dan up there. Yeah, like on top of, <laughs> of the boat as it was going through this major storm. Yeah. It was insane. It was crazy. And ha- till this day, how we were able to put that fire out, I don't know. Because typically a fire of that size, eight homes on fire would be what? A, a, at least a four alarm fire. At least maybe third more, alarm. Yeah, yeah. At least. Higher. Yeah. So we're talking about hundreds of firefighters would typically be unseen. And, you know, there'd be 50 fire trucks and all different types of material. And OEM would probably show up. And you'd yep. have all these resources. I don't remember who requested it. It might have been RJ. I remember him getting on the radio as we pulled up and he goes uh, to our dispatcher. He goes, send me help. You know, notify Island Park, notify Oceanside, all these surrounding towns that would typically show up. And our dispatcher goes, chief, can't. And RJ wasn't able to process it. So he goes, okay, that's fine. Get me whoever you can. And the dispatcher, I think it was Griffin, Mm -hmm. who's one of our our senior dispatchers, uh, was like, chief, listen, you have nobody coming to help you. And I remember hearing that on the radio and going, oh, shit, we're by ourselves. We're completely by ourselves. We ended up having, I think, two engine trucks there from, uh, I think it was engine two and engine four. Because mm-hmm. like you said, engine one couldn't get there. They took a boat. They took a boat, yep. Uh, ladder two and the tower ladder. Yep. And that was it. So yep. we're talking four fire trucks, maybe 30 firefighters, maybe 40 at most mm. to fight. An, I don't even think you had that many I don't people think there. so, yeah. To fight eight, to eight homes that were on fire. And we, I don't know how we did it. I, again, I, I I don't know. There was definitely, you know, I, I honestly feel that there was some divine intervention <laughs> looking out for us there because, yeah. I mean, the one house that was on the north end of that, it didn't burn. Had some fire damage from the heat and everything, the radiant heat, but it didn't burn. And, you know, they're so close together. How did they not go up? But how did the houses, a couple of houses in the block behind them went on fire, but how did not the whole block go up? And, you yeah, know, I don't know. And then I, I remember seeing even guys from the Point Lookout Lido Fire Department, which is one of our neighboring towns. They had they ended up uh, walking over with a boat also. Yep. Um, some of those guys came over because they they knew we needed help. Um, yeah. and they put a portable pump, I think, on on this boat, and I think they put some tools inside. And uh, yeah, that was a, I mean, but even wild before then, experience. like before before that big uh, job happened, we were getting calls for car fires. Car fires were just lighting off left and right yeah. all all night long. Where it got to the point where. Uh, the guys would be driving the rigs, and it didn't matter if it was an engine, ladder, or rescue truck. They would drive the rigs towards the car, hit the brakes, and the wave would just put the fire out because we couldn't stay there to put the fire out properly. Right. It went out. Yeah. Smart. But, yeah. oh, I, I, I was, you know, <laughs> it's amazing, you know, when you're faced, you know, when you're face to face with, you know, I don't want to say tragedy or, you know, the inevitable or, you know, your last licks. But what the stuff that people come up with, yeah, you know, when, when you have to be resourceful and, and, you know, and that comes with years of training, years of, you know, thinking and, you know, size up. It, it, it's like no matter what it is, like I'll be driving down the street and I was looking at the buildings here. And the first thing I saw was I was sizing up a building at the end of the block. 
and I don't live here. I'm yeah. never going to be here. Right. But when I drive around town all day, I'm constantly sizing things up. And you know, what would happen if this went on fire? What would if that went on fire? What if this? So I, I honestly think with the the experience that we had there, that the guys knew and the girls knew, this is we don't have time for this. Let's just come up with something better. Yeah, you know, you know we had we had senior firefighters that were there. Me not being one of them. Um, you know, you just brought it up. Now looking back at it. All those guys and gals who were there, who were the seniors, they all had their own families. Yeah, they left their families to make sure that the city was was safe. If it wasn't for them, we would have lost the entire city. They left city. them twice because they left them during Irene as well. Yeah, yeah. So huge shout out. There's too many people to name. You can't name but them. But massive shout out to all the senior firefighters, EMTs, paramedics that were well, uh, Massive stayed. shout out to all the volunteers that yeah. in, in all of Nassau and of Suffolk course. and up and down oh, right. the East yeah. Coast. You know. Yeah. You know they. We. I'm just getting. I'm telling a story for them. Yeah. But they were all in the same boat we were. So. Uh, Shout out to all the volunteers and all the the paid firefighters up and down, you know, because we all end the fire the, the cops and EMS and the military. Don't forget we had the military the guard, there as the well. National Guard came. I remember so I remember after that incident had happened and just feeling just even though we put the fire out, I remember feeling so defeated. Like my 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 home, right? Because I lost I lost my 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 basement and, and my first floor of my house and a lot of all of our guys. Everybody lost their home essentially. Yep. And I just remember feeling so defeated. Like yeah. our town is destroyed. It looks like a fucking war zone. And I remember going back to the firehouse after the fire was out. It was probably like maybe like five, six o'clock in the morning. I remember the sun coming up, but we were exhausted. So I remember falling asleep. It may have only been for 45 minutes, but it just it felt refreshing. What I got woken up to the next morning was the um, U.S. Coast Guard helicopters flying overhead. And I remember looking out. We had a small window in our bunk room. And I remember looking out the window and going, oh, help, help, help has finally arrived. And they, they did. They landed, I think, at a... At a a school or, or the rec center they landed somewhere yeah, yeah. And they started setting up a, you know a mass casualty hospital and uh the, the water had receded at that time so um oem the state oem had, had yep. i guess called in uh, help from a lot of upstate fire departments and police departments and we had departments from across new york state come to it not just to our aid but from yeah, everybody everywhere. all the departments that came down to nassau county were from the albany area yeah and uh they came down and i mean i, I at one point i was laughing because we have such modern, state-of-the-art equipment here in Nassau County that we we protect our firefighters. And, you know, I mean, I, I hate to say it, the budgets on these people are, in some of our departments, are astronomical. It's, it's almost embarrassing. Yeah. But I remember this one department, Selkirk, Selkirk, New York. Guy came down, he had a chief car and uh, two guys that were in a tanker. And when I'd say a tanker truck, it was like in Toy Story, Tow Mater. I mean, that's what this thing looked like. It, it was embarrassing looking, but these guys were here to help. And uh, we have another house fire, and they respond to it. They're the first engine I was, there. I was actually first on scene for that. I called in that fire. The, the one on uh, Curly Street. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, I, was, I was on my way to work. So these guys, they, they pull up, and the guy that got out of the... Uh, the, the, well, the first off, the fire chief was like, who's our fast officer? Who's our reconnaissance officer? Who's our logistics chief? I was like, chief, with all due respect, we're putting the wet stuff on the red stuff, and this is going out. Yeah. That's it. So their engine, their tanker pulls up, and I see, I mean, it's, this was a big guy that gets out of the truck <laughs> smoking a cigar. <laughs> and I'm just like, and he's got his jacket open, and I'm just like, <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. So this guy, he stretches some hose off all by himself. Charges the line, he goes in and he puts the fucking fire out. I mean, I was just a cigar jacket. I was just like, oh my! And like, while this is going on, I'm I'm talking with the chief, and I'm like, chief, you, uh, just so you know, we have a lot of high rises here. I said, if you need me to, what I'll do is I'll put a bucket of red paint on every rig, and we'll paint it to look like barns, so you guys feel familiar. And man, did I swallow my words. You know, I mean, don't judge a book by its cover, but yeah. I mean, it's just. I actually ran into him. I went on a cruise in April uh, with my wife and kids. And I saw a guy wearing a Selkirk Fire Department shirt, and I just <laughs> tell him, Bill, Rich, I'm like, holy, holy cow. Shit. Oh, yes, yeah. Yeah. So wow. it, yeah. it, it was pretty awesome. So, uh, yeah. But I mean, the city is still recovering. Yeah. You, you mentioned about houses still not being built. Uh, I originally thought that the city was done for. Yeah. Everybody yeah. said the city is done for. Yeah, we all thought that for sure. You know, now th with the building back, I mean, there was some issues with, you know, FEMA, New York Rising, yeah. horror stories. Of course. Uh, like my older brother, his house had to be torn down. Same thing in Jersey. Yep. Yeah. My younger brother had to rip out his basement. Uh, I was lucky I built a house later in life. So I had it on a, I had a crawl space. I was good. Lost my golf clubs. <laughs> but uh, if you don't know the struggle, <laughs> let me tell you. Uh, 
but I, I had 18 people living in my house. So I, I mean, it was, it was tough, but I, at least I had a place for everybody to go. Yeah. And, uh, what I learned is that the city of Long Beach and the residents, extremely resilient. Oh. I mean, talk about, you know, listen, you live on the beach your entire shout life. Shout out to Long Beach. Yeah, shout oh. out to the city of Long Beach. Shout out to, to all those that came to help us. Shout out to, to the administration that was there. It was a great, um, you know, experience to see everyone coming together, supporting one another. Um, and like like you're, you've both been saying, you know, we're still rebuilding, but it, it's it's just been really inspirational to watch all it, that. It, I mean, the, the people are moving to Long Beach and the Barrier Island like crazy. And the, the house prices are astronomical. And, you know, in a way that's fantastic. But, you know, for the young people that are coming up, it's tough. You know, people that have generations living in Long Beach, you know, it's it's tough. But, you know, I mean, when we first moved to Long Beach, the house was $35,000 that my parents bought. Wow. Now, you know, it's not even half of a down payment now. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So it's, uh, but I, uh, I, I, I loved being the fire chief. I loved every minute of it. I took my kids in the car with me. Uh, I had... Uh, I met some great people. Uh, let me just go back to Sandy. Something just popped into my mind. Uh, that was another thing that we didn't, uh, talk about after, you know, we had a couple of meetings. Hey, what's up guys? How you doing? Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And I remember two wives coming up to me, two of the members wives just crying with their kids with them. And I'm like, what's the matter? What's the matter? So-and-so went off the deep end. He's drinking again. Oh. Uh, you know, he, he hasn't been home. Uh, I can't find him or he's just being real abusive at home. He's what can I do? What, what can I do? You want me to find him? You want me to bring him home? She goes, I am so embarrassed right now, Richie. I go, there's nothing to be embarrassed. Everybody needs, everybody needs help right now. Absolutely. What do you need? She with a tear in her eyes. She said, I need groceries. And it was just, my heart was broken because she's, my house has no damage in it. I was one of those people that built my house. I put a generator in before it was popular. Right. And this poor woman with her kids, whose husband, and I'm, I'm not mad at the guy. You know, he didn't know how to deal with it. Right. And, yeah. you know, none of us do at the time. Mm -hmm. And just asking for groceries. You know, I was just like, what are we, what have we come to? And mm -hmm. it was just, oh, and we had another story. This is kind of funny. Another guy went off the deep end. He stopped coming around probably like the second or third day after Sandy and he showed up at the firehouse with his girlfriend. Like we had, to, we had set dinner times at the firehouse uh, because we had the state troopers there and we had the uh, national guard. So right after dinner was over with like the state troopers, and the national guard went back out, you know, so the mutual aid companies were standing by in the firehouse. So this guy comes up with his girlfriend. He goes, give me some food. We're like, all right, you can have, you know, what's left out. We, the ovens and the stoves are all clean. He pulls a fucking knife out. Oh, no. And he robs us. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> he stole food. Oh, and we're God. like, dude, we know who you yeah, are. You're one what of us, man. What are like, you doing? Wow. But, but I think like, that just shows the mindset. Th that, th like, that's we were what just... it was. I mean, you look like that day, it was like when I was, they, guys call me, this guy robbed the firehouse. I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> he pulled the knife on us. I was like, stop. So I go down there. So he was a volunteer fireman who did yeah, this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. So, yeah. but it, you know, hearing the story, like, I wasn't mad. I was kind of flabbergasted. I was just like, no. Wow. Are you serious? Yeah. But like people were in survival mode. They they just didn't know how to handle the stress. It's like, like you said, people started drinking again. I, I was only 22 when it happened. And even myself, I caught myself one night excessively drinking about maybe a week after Sandy. And I was like, because I don't typically do that. I'm not really a big drinker myself. And I was like, whoa, like, yeah, we all just, we all dealt with it differently. Yeah. I, uh, one of the things I would do is I would, uh, take my chief car to Oceanside and they would give us gas and I would fill up a couple of gas cans for the members. And, uh, I was very involved in AA years ago and I felt the need to, you know, listen, I cannot do this on my own. Mm. And I kept telling myself, this is a perfect excuse. Yeah. No one will be mad at me if I start drinking again. Right. You know, which would lead down the road to other things. And I was just like, there's no shame. And, you know, it's like, you know, do I start drinking again or do I, you know, do my job and keep my family? Yeah. So it's, it, it just, a lot of people dealt with it differently. And, uh, that, that, I mean, we had some funny stories. We had some unbelievable stories. And we had some sad stories, but you know, the members still came around after all that. And we had a fire department. We had a guy, uh, his name was Jamison Shea. He was a volunteer with us for a couple of years. 
he ended up getting a, a paid firefighter position up in Massachusetts where his family is from. And it's like uh, generations of people that were up there. And he uh, he got together a crew of guys. They uh, It was about an eight-hour drive. They said, we're going to come down and help. I was like, no, we got all the help. He goes, no, no, we're coming down to gut houses. Mm. And they came down just to rip people's houses out for them. Wow. Because the, – and other places, like you get kids, notes from kids from upstate schools. Yeah. You get, you know, people from – Upstate sending paper towels. But the craziest thing, and I remember it was one morning, probably about four or five days after Sandy, I, I got up early. I drive up. I'm like, I'm going to get some coffee for everybody. I drove to Rockville Center from Long Beach, 10-minute drive. There's people getting on the train. Their paper under their arm with their attache case. And <laughs> like stuff. nothing happened. Like nothing. And it, it, what made me think is during – I. Uh, Katrina. Remember during Katrina? Yeah. Watching it on TV. Oh, that sucks. Yep. Click. And then, you know, I'm watching Jerry Springer. Yep. You never know. You know, I never knew what those people, oh, those poor people, that sucks. I hope they're okay. Click. And it's out of my life. Yep. You know, here you good fucking guys are 10 years later bringing it up, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm just kidding. No. It's it, it's something I'll never forget. Uh, I, and it, it's like history. It's like, you know, we want everybody to learn about 9-11. We want everybody to learn about the first World Trade Center bombing. We want everybody to learn about the Ukraine and Russia. I want everybody that lives in Long Beach or has an affiliation to, to know about what it was like. Yeah. You know, and uh, that's it. But uh, one other call I wanted to discuss, uh, if it's okay. Do you, Sorry, do you hear that? There's like, there was like a hissing. There's probably something in the back. It sounds, like, it sounds like rain. Wait, is that the rain? That's the rain. It sounded like That's it was rain. rain. Well, you oh, got, it is. Holy shit. I thought, it, I thought we were having a you guys better go sound get my, issue. You better go get my car for me. I thought we were having a sound issue. That's just heavy, heavy <laughs> rain coming down. You're probably going to get a call in a minute or two. <laughs> Let me just check. Uh, <laughs> no, we're good. Speaking about flooding. Yeah, speaking about flooding. Yeah. Uh, another issue that we dealt with a lot was uh, water emergencies in the ocean and the bay. Mm. And uh, one call that I have never, ever forgotten about is uh, it was a beautiful day uh, just before the lifeguards come on duty. The water was flat, not a cloud in the sky, light breeze, wind from the north, so the ocean was flat. And uh, we got a call for a missing swimmer. So I, I, I drive up there, I, I get there first, and I'm looking out, and I'm like, no way. I said, there's no way. There's little, it, it, flat as this table, the ocean. I couldn't believe it. Clear, blue, as far as you, you can see New Jersey. So... I run down to the waterline and I see a lady in the water screaming. So like Austin, I strip off my uniform. I jump in with my, uh, I had my boxers on at the time. So it was cool. And so Skins. I go out to this lady and I'm like, what are you doing? I can't find her. I can't find her. I go, who? One of my students. Wow. So this lady was a teacher in New York City. She had an unauthorized trip to the beach with her class from Harlem. I remember this. They took the subways. They took the railroad, walked down to the beach because they did something really good in class. So she wanted to reward them. And uh, I, I, it's like I, she's telling me we're this close talking. I'm, I'm not believing her. I'm not believing her. There's no way somebody is drowning here. Right. There's no way. So. I get back to the ocean, back to land. I get on my radio, uh, confirming it. And uh, so we ended up getting tons and tons of resources. Like Town of Hempstead sent lifeguards down. Long Beach had lifeguards down. They have everyone's joining arms. NYPD helicopter. And right, yeah. yeah. Di I, we never put divers in the ocean because, you know, with the waves and everything. But it was so flat. We put divers in. We had every, I called everybody that I could think of. Everybody. And we found her about 45 minutes later. And I literally broke down. Because this little girl, she did good in school. She was being rewarded for a trip. She was beach. twelve. She was twelve, by the way, right? I think Nicole Nicole Suriel. I will yeah. never forget her. I will never forget that name as long as I live. And I I talk I talk about her a lot. I talk about my friends that died on nine eleven. I talk about you know funny job stories. I tell the story about this little girl because it was so unnecessary. You know, like in Long Beach, we we're on a barrier round. In second grade, you have to take swimming. In schools, you have to. Right. Because no matter what you do, no matter what you teach your kids, they're going to go to a beach party one night and they're going to go in the ocean. They're going to do it. Yeah. We did it. Everyone's going to do it. Sure. But this poor little girl who was led with such bad decisions by these teachers and the administrators and, you know, and it just, that's, that call, I mean, 
there was no fire. There was no car accident. There was no extrication. There was no blood and guts. It was just the it's innocence. It's the that sticks with you. It's just, yeah, I, I've seen, we've all seen the blood and guts. We've all seen the burned bodies. We've seen, you know, but just, it was so unfair, that call. Yeah. It was so unfair. And I remember them finding her, bringing her out of the, out of the ocean. And I was uh, the first EMT that was standing next to the lifeguard truck. And just where I happened to be standing and where they happened to find her. And she was, she was really close to shore. Which yeah. is what I also remember because the lifeguards originally had gone all the way out, and they were like Rich was saying they were searching for so long. We thought that she was taken out. You know, she, we knew she would be by the rocks somewhere. That's typically where the bodies end up, but she was maybe like fifteen feet, not even from the shoreline. I yeah, just, and, and more towards the middle. Yeah, that's what. That's which what, is, the whole situation was just weird. Oh. And I remember they, they found her, and they, they. I remember it was actually a town of Hempstead lifeguard yep. that found her. Uh, their feet kicked, ended up kicking her body. They bring her up out of the water, and she was pale white, like. Mm. I, just white as a ghost. And I, I remember like when I was, when I was in the water before everybody got there, as I was diving, I was saying, please let me find her, but please, I don't want to touch anything. Yeah. You know, it's just, it was just, you know, they, they pull her out. Right. And they're bringing her towards me. I thought they were bringing her actually to me. I didn't realize I was standing behind the lifeguard truck. <laughs> so I'm like, I froze. I have never froze before. I was yeah. like, Oh, Oh, I don't know what to do. And they get her on the lifeguard truck. And we as first responders, we know she's, unfortunately, she, she had passed away, clearly. But there was such a scene. There was so many other firefighters. The, the entire class watched yeah. her, their friend get dragged out of the water. And the, But then everybody, you know, because of the helicopters, everybody just, yeah, whoa, what's whole going beach. on? All, everybody came down to look. I think news cameras may have even been yep. there by then. And news I just camera. remember, like, I remember hearing them say, just do CPR. And yep. I, I was like, why? And then I, I didn't realize it's because... The I, show. Don't, I don't want to say you're putting on a show, but it's, it. it's really we were. It we gives were, comfort to the family. It gives comfort yeah. to the family. It shows the kids that we were trying. We knew she had been dead for, dead for probably 35 plus minutes under that yeah. water. And they were still doing CPR on her. And then we threw her in the back of the ambulance. I didn't jump on. This was a full, you know, all the paramedics oh, jumped yeah, on. That was and all ALS. They took off, you know, full police escort to the hospital. And we, you know, we knew she was dead, but we found out a few minutes later that they pronounced her at the hospital. My brother was the uh, detective that had to go to her parents' house. Oh, God. I can only so it's like my family was like so entwined in this. It was. Oh, yeah. What happens to the teacher? She ended up getting fired, but not charged. Yeah, it was, I mean, I, I felt bad for her too. Yeah, she didn't. She was thought she was. Doing she was something. doing the right thing, you know. She yeah, thought she was she rewarding was. her kids, but it's yeah. just, and it's such a litigious society. And I mean, it, that it, that's I don't care about that. But you know, she thought she was doing the right thing. But you know, you're a teacher; you should know better. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's the ocean; it's not a pool. Yeah, it's yeah. not like a even a pool is dangerous. I yeah. Mean, yeah. You do, don't do it as a teacher. Just, yeah. you know, obviously. Well, that just goes to show. I know we're, we're running low on time here. Yeah. But I, just have, I just have two follow, two questions. Yes. One yeah. is, do you see less people, and I'll just ask both of them, you can answer. Do you see less people volunteering to become firefighters? And uh, what are you doing to encourage people to do it? And what would you say now to get somebody to come and become a volunteer fire? Uh, become a volunteer firefighter. It can lead to amazing careers. Has with me. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you can get firefighter training. You can get EMS training. You can become a paramedic, you know, from an EMT to a paramedic. And right. you can get a job right off the bat like that. Uh, I see a lot less people doing it because of the time constraints, the uh, requirements, uh, the rules, uh, personal lives. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of times now, a lot of kids in society, you know, they don't understand the going out and communicating and making friends. And, you know, they don't understand the brotherhood yeah. or the sisterhood or the the fraternity of it. They don't understand the importance of helping your community. Uh, one of the things that uh, NASA OEM, we have what's called the SAFER grant. It's an opportunity where if you're a volunteer firefighter, you can go to NASA Community College for free. Whoa. If you pass, we'll pay for, we'll pay your bills. Uh, if you're going to be, and it's all prorated. Uh, but it's, it's funny because uh, like, these younger kids now, uh, they don't understand if it's for free, it doesn't mean you don't have to do anything. Right. Whereas, you know, the parents lay out the money, we'll reimburse you. But if junior doesn't go to college and gets F's across the boards or all incompletes, yeah. you know, and if they're minors, like say, as you have a 17 year old in college, we have to call the parents and be like, sorry, too bad. No, so or if they, they go, Hey, where's my check? Uh, I better talk to junior about that. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it, it's a great organization. I love it. Uh, I'm not as active as I should. Really at all anymore. I'm kind of old, and uh, I got a lot going on in my you're personal a, you're, life. You're a little busy. You're the yeah, OEM you're commissioner. OEM. I think, uh, I think you get out. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm a father of twins that are going to be going seniors this year. So uh, uh, that's uh, 
That's all awesome. I got. So, but, well, you say you're not involved. You're 100 percent involved. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. You're the you're the main guy for the entire county. You know what it is? I figured you know, you know when you do something good and you you're on top. Yeah. I want to leave on top. I don't want to come <laughs> back and do something completely stupid that ruins everything I, I've worked hard sure. for. I hear that. Um, so last thing, I know that you brought something with you. Yes. To the muster room. Brought a couple of things. All right. So let's see what you got for us. All right. Now, for those of you who are just watching for the first time, every time somebody comes into the muster room, we ask them to bring something that's personal to them, that means something to them, that we can put in our studio to let people know that they can see who's been here before and, and uh, what they've gone through. Yeah. Uh, I know you guys are both uh, cops and retired cops, and uh, uh, I'm a huge supporter of the law enforcement community. My son actually volunteered with uh, the organization a couple of times, and uh, it changed him forever. So, and uh, your brother. And my brother, yes. The lieutenant with the police department. Yeah, my brother's lieutenant in Long Beach Police Department. Who was actually my boss for my younger brother was my boss for about a year, <laughs> so thank God we had we had my mother to square away any issues. So uh, that's it. So this is a uh, Long Beach Police Department challenge coin. Uh, this was given to me by somebody that was very very important to me in my life in my career. This was given to me by former Commissioner Mike Tagney, who did forty two years in wow. the Long Beach Police Department, and when he retired, he passed away twenty two months later. Yeah, uh, he uh, formed the lives of many kids, uh, coached, mentored. He was my soccer coach. Yep. He was uh, my boss. He was the type of guy that if he saw like, kids that he knew, he would stop and say, if you're doing good, if he saw you doing wrong, he wouldn't call your parents. He'd straighten you out. So uh, really great man in my life. So this, he gave this to me. Uh, I do have another one at home. So I would, uh, I would like his memory to be shared with you guys. Of course. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, a challenge coin from uh, the city of Long Beach. Uh, it's, they were made after Sandy and it's got the front city, the new city logo that they have. And on the back, it says, uh, stronger, safer, smarter, smarter. That's the one. And lastly, it's, uh, I had a few of these, so I'd like to bring it in. This is our, uh, hurricane Sandy bar oh, wow. that we had for our uniforms that everybody got. So phenomenal. that's it. Thank Rich. You. Thank you. We appreciate Thanks, you Austin. It's that good in. to see you. Yeah, you it's so good seeing you as well. Uh, nice to uh, meet you. You've been a phenomenal guest. I knew you would be. I, I appreciate that. I, I was a little nervous. I'm not going to lie. It's, oh, you did yeah. sound it. You sa yeah, sounded great. Thanks. Yeah. It's, it's funny because it, watching you grow up and stuff and that, the way you've brought things and how far you push things to, you know, to make things better for a lot of people, you know, we always thought you were a little snotty kid from down the block, but <laughs> he yeah. is. Oh, I know. But you know what? <laughs> Underneath that, you know, exterior that, you know, there's, there's a heart of gold and, you know, I, I, I got to give uh Props to his parents for that. You know, his hardworking mom, hardworking dad. Mom and dad. Yeah, his dad is a very hardworking electrician who. Uh, yeah, I've, I've met mom and dad. Mom and dad are nice, very yeah. nice people. I yeah. met mom a couple of times, but Larry, he uh, he does a lot of work for a lot of people. He takes care of my mom's electrical needs, and he does the right thing. Very so nice. shout out to uh, Eclect eclectic electric, electric, eclectic electric. Give Larry a call. <laughs> He's gonna be retiring needs. soon. Good for him. Yeah, he deserves soon. it. He's been talking a lot about it oh, a lot. And did he ever tell you the time that he yelled at me because he got a new Suburban? I didn't know that, and I put a ticket on it. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, you know, I, I didn't, not everybody tells me. When, I was giving parking tickets out for a long time. No one ever tells me when they get a new car, <laughs> but they told me when they get a ticket. So, Yeah, I've right. called you, I think, once or twice. <laughs> it happens. Yeah. So, again, Rich, thank you so much. It's Thanks been an absolute pleasure. Again, shout out to the City of Long Beach. Shout out to the City of Long Beach Fire Department, Nassau County OEM. I mean, you got a resume you know, longer than uh, this table, so... <laughs> <laughs> you've done a lot of great work. Thank you for all you do. Um, we appreciate it. And you've been a great guest. Again, thank you for coming in. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it, guys.